know, this is really about as early a production car in America that would really kind of run today. I mean, this is, for 1905 in an American car, there's not, there's not very many of these in the whole world that run. I see two Mitchells here, Alan. Tell us the story. All right, well, this is the 1904 Mitchell. This is pretty much the, the very first Mitchell. This is the, this, this Mitchell, that's this Mitchell in Racine, Wisconsin in fall of 1903. And the two um, wives of the company are sitting in the car in front of the Mitchell Mansion in Racine, Wisconsin. This is an air-cooled two-speed um, or two-cylinder engine three-speed transmission, progressive. It goes about 30 miles an hour. Um, it's pretty nice car. It's a good London to Brighton car. It's 30 miles an hour is pretty much its top speed that you want to go. 25 might be more comfortable. Uh, this was at a time when production just barely started in America. You know, we didn't have anything really going on yet. Uh, and they made maybe five of these cars or 10 of these cars. Where were they built? Racine, Wisconsin. Oh, Racine. Oh, okay, got you. And then and Mitchell made wagons the day before they made this car. And they were a wagon works company from the 1850s. Mm. So that's what their real business was. But they wanted to get into the foray of automobile manufacturing. And then they manufactured this car, i.e. they bought the parts in catalogs, I like, like this in 1903, and assembled this car. And they called it a Mitchell. Oh, wow. So this is... Still a Mitchell car, yeah, and it's every bit as a Mitchell as any car would have been at that time called a Mitchell, say. Yeah. But they bought the parts and they assembled it. Okay. So, so this was only so the car next to it. This is a 1905 Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, this one would be considered today as a 1906 model year, but this was produced in the, the autumn of 1905. Uh -huh. We have the first pink slip for the car. It says 1905, and for the first hundred and some years, it was a 1905 Mitchell. But that doesn't matter so much. They didn't care about years back then. Um, the cars were just coming online. But this is only basically one year or a year and a half apart. This is a 65 mile an hour car. This is a 300 cubic inch uh, F head motor, which is an amazing engine. Uh, and you can drive this reliably at 50 miles an hour and climb up an 18% grade at 35 or 40 miles an hour. It's a monster. Wow. And this monster was produced just a year or year and a half after this one was produced. So for Mitchell at least, this one was considered state of the art and then a year or two later, this one. Like what a big change. Yeah, but, but, the, but the neat thing is to compare that change to what was happening in the world Mm -hmm. uh, we, the last video we did was the 1907 Renault, but Europe was five to seven years ahead. So the 1907 Renault compared to the 1905 Mitchell, you know, that this would be the Renault, if you redated it, comparing it to the Mitchell, you'd add the seven years to the Renault that would make it a 1914 Renault in relationship uh -huh. okay. because they were so much farther ahead. Right. I see but you see, saying. even in America, which was again, five to seven years behind Europe, you know, look how much they advanced in just a year, year and a yeah, half. Absolutely. And this is an amazing, amazing vehicle. Okay. Well, let's get into it. Why don't you tell okay. us what, what is, uh, what did Mitchell do to make, make this happen? Okay, this car they made a lot of. They made uh, as many as 40 to 50 cars of this model. This was the D2 slash D4. The D2 was the two passenger, D4 was the four passenger. 300 cubic inch motor, big F head motor. Uh, F head means the, the um, valves that were on the top going up and down in the end from the bottom and had a camshaft that operated both the intake valves and the exhaust valves, where this has poppet valves. Okay. So this one, the, the exhaust valves are on, on a cam, but okay. the intake were, were by suction. Oh. And this one's actually being driven. So okay. this one has got, um, this one is overhead valves, which you can see nicely, mm -hmm. outside push rods. And then they even made it pretty neat. You, they even had inspection windows so you could even watch it run as it, it was running. Oh, wow. So let me make sure I understand this. Are these intake valves on top? Yes, they are. And where are the exhaust valves? Right below it. 
right here. Okay, I just didn't quite see it. There we go. Need to make sure I show that. Because from looking up top, you don't really see them that easily. I guess this angle, I can see them a little better. Wow, okay. So I'll go ahead and choke the engine. Wow, that's quiet. I'm surprised how quiet it is. Such a smooth idle. So, and it was totally cold. Look at that, watching the crankshaft. So there's a there's a cam running along the side there, pushing the, the yes. valve from below. Okay. Wow. That's running great. It'll what? run as, when it warms up as 45 to 50 RPM. No. And it'll ride like that for an hour if you want it to. Wow. So you entered in one of the great American races with this car? I entered the race, but we ended up using our 1910 Knox. Okay. But this car was ready. Okay. Um, um, it's, we're gonna we're doing an event, New London to New Brighton in August. It's about 400 miles total with the, the three backup days. Okay. Um, and then the last day is 120 miles, and we'll travel at 45 mile an hour, I guess, for it. Wow, that's fascinating. So this is this is the original pink slip. For and this car. was the first car in California. In Northern Registry. California, in Butte in, County. Okay, in the county. So okay. this is the pink slip, and it's, it's more than a 100-year-old pink slip on a car. <laughs> and it's got the same family that bought the car brand new, which is the grandfather of this guy here, Frank Yeoman. Wow. Which is really cool. That is really great. So there's another one of these. I have several of these, the registrations for them. Some uh -huh. you can read easily and not, some of them you can't. Yeah. Okay, this is a copy of the deed to Frank Yeoman on the purchase of the 40 acres in paradise. And that's where I took the car back when I got it done. Mm -hmm. um, so it was in this property since 1912. And he bought, bought the property for $600 in gold coin and paid $2,200 for the car. <laughs> wow. So, and, they, and the 30 members of the family still live there. That's wild. Mm -hmm. So this is Frank Yeoman right there. It's him. Okay. And then this is in Oroville, this was a postcard in Oroville from 100 years ago. And that's him. Wow. In the car. Mm hmm that's, that's interesting. It is. This is uh, Bob Toll in June. That's, that's the grandson and, um, and his wife in the car. And that this was... Is after, obviously after you restored it. Yeah, that was when I, when I did the first restoration after two months after getting the car. Uh, they bought the car new in 1905 in November. The Feather River flooded in the town of Oroville and in Dredgerville and killed 25% of the people in the town. Wow. And then they went back two months later and got the car out of the river and they put it, they took it out of the river and put it in the basement of their house from 1906 to 1991. That's why it was in the basement because it was dest well, not destroyed, destroyed from the, in from the river. The Feather River flooded. Yeah. Okay. And then this is a postcard of it in the Feather River, it's an artistic postcard. Yeah. But that's a, that's, that's a postcard of it, which is kind of neat. You don't see that's your car really, in a postcard. No, that's wild. This is the owner's manual of the actual car. And this is a D2 or D4, which is the biggest model they had, which is the high speed one. I love old owner's manuals like that. That's just fascinating. So that is this car. Wow. I mean, that was a project just putting that owner's manual together. And it's beautiful. It's, yeah. Uh, so it's 120 years old. Wow. And then um, here's the Butte County uh, in Dredgerville. This is what the first owner did. He ran the dredgers. Mm -hmm. And then he ran his dredger right next to Woodrow Wilson's dredger, which is also in the Feather River in Dredgerville, which is outside of Oroville.
and then it showed the families that lived there before the flood happened. These are the families that lived in in Dredgerville before the flood happened, and that's that's them. Yep, I see that. And then it showed they died in the some people died in the flood and all, and, wow. and these are all historic things in in that, which is pretty it's interesting. It, all of these are connected to this one car. Yeah, one. I mean, so it's and there's the nice brochure of the car saying uh -huh. it, all of its victory. So <clears throat> to back up what our little poster says, this backs up as far as the races that it won and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the, the D4. And it's, it's listed as 28 horsepower, 30 horsepower, 34 and 35 horsepower based on which ads that you see. <laughs> but the, this is the, uh, the, of the car and that's the racing um, prowess that it won. Wow, look at that. Now the, the D4 and the D2 model uh, if, a, if a purist is involved in the Mitchell registry and archival information, it would be considered as a 1906 car today. Mm -hmm. But it was always considered, and it was on the, on the pink slip, and the first registration is in 1905. They didn't care about years. In 1905, it was about the first time that Americans did any productions of cars whatsoever. There was no such thing as a model year of this, a model year of that. Right. You had a car and nobody else had a car at all. So, so now we can look back and say, well, that was a 1906 or 1905. Right. Well, this was delivered in 1905. So for the registration people and the county recorder, it's yeah. a 1905 car, it was delivered in 1905. Right. Yeah. Why are you calling 1906 car? When right. You... <laughs> so it's... So it was, the family always knew it as 1905, so did the state of California. So it's a 1905 in that aspect. Right. But it might be a 1906 model year car. Interesting, yeah. So. It, that whole uh, model year business was kind of in flux at that time. Oh, it was. And then um, there's a, it's the only D2 or D4 in the world. And this is the Mitchell, this is the list of all of the Mitchell cars that, that um are around today okay so that's that's just kind of interesting the list is pretty short on some of those early years <laughs> yeah like one <laughs> right one car and then mitchell the day before they made mitchell cars which is before the 1903 in there 1904 mm -hmm. they made wagons that was what the big the company made was wagons okay so that's some of the original they wagon a big operation paperwork apparently. Uh, Frank Yeoman was an engineer, which is great. And then he redesigned a few things on his Mitchell car. Oh, so wow. that's Frank Yeoman's signature on his drafting copy. Mm -hmm. And this is the engine. So even though we were rebuilding it, you know, uh, two or three years ago, mm -hmm. he did some things and made notations on things. So that's pretty interesting. The owner of it from 120 some years ago, uh, made really perfect drawings of his car interesting yeah and and signed them wow but and, at that era though this was like space age to them right? it was it was yeah and he's an engineer he's an engineer running the dredger operation there yeah he has the car the only car woodrow wilson has a car also okay but so there's two cars in the area but he got his car before woodrow wilson which who became the president later sure. and woodrow wilson came in as an engineer for the dredging operation also oh so they okay. were both engineers they were peers <laughs> in that sense so that was really kind of funny wow uh and woodrow wilson went on to become president yep and frank yeoman stayed in oroville and he did a yeoman's duty <laughs> yeah <laughs> so th that's what that is so that's interesting you just know it ever see that it is these are the original documents from the motor vehicle um, that shows Frank Yeoman, and it was called Thermalito then, as well as Dredgerville, as well as Oroville. Okay. And that shows where, <clears throat> where they lived. And this plate, I have this original plate still, license plate. Do you really? I could bring that out, but I, I huh. have that. And before we started the engine, it was completely cold. Yes, we did start it yesterday, but it starts... I, I can't imagine any modern car starting any quicker. No, it started right up. And it's 110, 100, almost 120 years old. Yeah, wow. 
No, that is, I mean, how, it, it, you might say it runs like new. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's, so um, did you do any work on this engine itself? Yes. Okay. What did this you do? Is, okay, this engine, this engine, um, I rebuilt it 30 years ago. And going up a big steep hill climb in California, in 18% grade, I broke the crankshaft. When, uh -oh. I, when I broke the crankshaft, I messed up number th three and number four as far as the... Um, Those are the journals, right? Yeah, the, basically the journals. And these are just placed in position. That's what happened when it, when it broke. Okay. These were not supported on the, to the crankshaft. These were free-floating. Oh. So then what I made was I made caps like what you would have on your teeth. Mm -hmm. I machined those by hand. Each of those are billet pieces okay. um, that weighed 10 pounds each of aluminum. And I would put it on the mill and I kept making that piece. And then I, I took the original crankcase and I milled out all the bad okay. material. Mm -hmm. And then you have to keep milling out all of that material because this casting of aluminum happened 120 years ago mm -hmm. when they had a lot of zinc in the castings at the time okay. and there was lots of porosity. So you had to compl you, you check the whole thing in the mill and you kept cutting a, the material away until you found no porosity in the aluminum below it. Oh, I see. And then I, I milled it so I had a perfect cross or a, you know, a T. Mm -hmm. And then on, on what I made on these inserts, I made them with that same cross. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I was ready to place them in position, I created a, a boring bar, which is what this is. Oh, I see. To keep everything in registration. Right. Uh -huh. And then so I would place them in, in position, putting that, that bar in pl position. When I got them close enough, mm -hmm. then I went ahead and clamped it all together. Yep. And I heliarched, and with a friend, heliarched them all in place. And when I got all done, I actually bridged across. Oh, yeah. I bridged across now, so it's both sides of the crankcase. And then this is my finished project with it all finished. Yes, yeah, so you made it stronger than factory. Much more, much stronger. And then to be a good steward of the automobile, if I have a 1904 Mitchell and a 1905 Mitchell, I also want to have the owner's manual from a 1906 or 1907, 1908. Mm -hmm. So this was a 1908 Mitchell motor. Okay. So they actually did do the bridging across. Okay. So they recognized that was a weakness. Yeah. So what I did was by doing it, when I got done, was still what they did, what yeah. they did later. Yeah, your solution was the same as theirs was, really. Right. So, Interesting. So now it runs perfectly. Yeah. And that's it all finished together. And that was six months ago. I, yeah, I don't know. No, actually a, a year now ago Okay, I did that, that you did that. Wow. During COVID. Yeah. Huh. Well, that, what a spectacular success, putting that together and having it run like that. First thing we're looking at... <clears throat> Is this is your, this is how you, you measure your, your gas in your gas tank. Okay. So the AAA, is, this isn't new, the AAA was an automotive accessory company okay. and they helped motorists to find hotels and things, okay. which were 50 cents at the time. Huh. This was a gasoline gauge. So you put this in the tank and the tank is underneath the, the seat. Okay. So you just push this in the tank and it tells you you have a gallon or two gallons or three gallons. Huh. So it holds about seven or eight gallons this car. And then you put this back in its holder. The original years, they didn't have license plates on the cars for California. So this is the original tags for this car. Oh. So that's the little bronze tags. So we can go back to the back of the car. Oh. So when they first came out with license plates for almost all states, they didn't have metal. They had leather. And then the owner, on, based on the number that you, you're given by the motor vehicle, you created your own license plate huh. and you created your own license plate by the telegraph and telephone poles so these are telegraph telephone pole um, numbers oh and then this was the well, this was the california or whatever state that you're in uh -huh. your designation to show what state you're in so that's what, how all the original plates were wow. and then this one is a legal registered car mm -hmm. and that's the registration's good to your to the year 2025 so here in arizona this is literally licensed for the road yeah, it is. Excellent. And we have the we have the 
state presented plate to the, the, the normal plate and we pay for the personalized plate of putting the real number on it. Mm -hmm. But that shows from a historical standpoint what it really was at the yeah. time. So we just put the tags on that and we keep the other plate with us and it's, it's fine. And yeah, that's fantastic. If it ever becomes not fine, then we'll do it differently. But deal with it, yeah. This is a convertible and the top lays back and then it straps in position. So you can make the, uh, the top not unfurl and mess up on you. Sure. The rear view mirror they didn't have in 1905. Okay. But just to make it a little bit safer. So it's out of brass at least, bronze. Yep. This is a kerosene lantern. Okay. Your marker lights on the side. Pretty safe, not very bright at all. This is a 1906 electric horn. Oh. European horn. It sounds really nice. I haven't honked it for 10 or 20 years, but I guess I would, I don't want to do it before we start out and make sure that, open, lubricate that motor, but it spins yeah. up okay. and it's a nice horn. Interesting. Uh, the wheels are wood wheels. And these were just done uh, 10 or 15 years ago. The Amish people did it in Ohio so that they don't click and they don't clack. Okay. They're really nice wheels. Uh huh. On the dash. So this is your ignition box. It's got four of your sparking coils in it. So they generate your sparks. They're like trembling coils. Uh huh. That's an original Mitchell clock. I think, does that say Mitchell on it? It does. That's an original Mitchell clock from the, from the era. Um, this is the oil pressure gauge. Okay. Uh, at idle, it's about five pounds of oil pressure, okay. but it's got lots of, um, I think the, the oil line is half inch diameter, so it's a really big line. So even though you think that five pounds isn't very much, that's a lot. A lot of volume, right? A lot of volume. And then they didn't have seals. They didn't have the rubber seals mm -hmm. that we have today. So there's graphite that are seals, and then there's different chamfered areas outside of the main bearings to let okay. the oil go back in. Uh -huh. So if you ran it at 10 pounds or 20 pounds, you'd have it come out of the front and the back of the engine. Yeah, you don't want that. So five pounds is more than enough. Uh -huh. um, this is your fuel pressure for your gasoline. It's gravity feed. Uh, it also has a little bit of pressure from the intake manifold. This is your ignition switch. <clears throat> Atwater Kent made this. You flip it here to run. And then I put, I machined an electric starter housing for this. <clears throat> okay. So I didn't do it where I made much modification, but I can just hit this button down here and it'll start by turning that on. I see. This is an original speedometer from 1903, oh, 1904. And it works. Wow. Um, it's a Warner, pretty valuable speedometer. It, even the odometer works. No kidding. This is the oiling box. And I filled this before our our ride this morning. Okay. So we have a pint of oil in here. <clears throat> Actually, we don't have enough in there. It, we don't have enough oil in there right now. But I have to go top it off, huh? Yeah, we will. Okay. So then as it's running, you see the oil as it goes down to the, each of the engine components. Uh -huh. Then this is a tool. And then this tool, you can adjust these to get oh. oil in different portions of the engine. And the tool is just kind of screwed on to here. I can pull that out. Sure. Um, I see what that, how that works. Yeah, so you've got, uh, it looks like about eight circuits of oil passages yep, there. Yep, you do. Wow. And okay. then um, it's conventional brake um, clutch, but the, the throttle pedal is in the center. Interesting. This is the, this is the Aramore horn. It's a train whistle. Okay. You can turn that on. I haven't turned that on for a while. Uh-huh. This is the uh, kill switch. Okay. If something goes wrong. You can kill the engine and make it not go anymore. Okay. Outside the car. This is the um, carbide generator. The, the lights in the front are carbide lights. It's, it's a mixture of carbide pellets and water. Creates a settling gas. These red lines take that acetylene gas that's generated by your carbon generator, uh -huh. carbide generator, and it feeds into these solar lamps. And this, wow. these are solar lamps are pretty valuable. And the, the glass is a, a pretty neat color. Wow. Yeah, the magnifier on that glass is yeah. just something. And these lights do work. And next time on the video, we'll come in the evening and I can light these up. They're a nice looking light, something yeah. that you would not expect to see. Interesting. In a car. Yeah, because uh, 
I mean, the thought is all these old cars, the lights were so deficient, you could barely see anything. No, they're pretty br darn bright. Okay. It takes you a while and I can't put it back in my building mm -hmm. when we get done with our ride because it'll continue to generate acetylene gas for hours and hours afterwards. I see. So I have to leave it outside Yeah. Uh, to, be, to be safe. Yeah. And a lot of farms and a lot of buildings back at the time, I'm sure, had problems with that acetylene gas from it. Yeah. So they're not perfectly safe, but right. they do work good. Okay. Uh, the windshield, they used plate glass back at the time. <clears throat> I have safety glass inside this. Okay. So it's it's safer than it was. Yep. And then this windshield, if to be really racy, you can fold this down. These are. Oh. You see how that works? Yeah. Look at that. So you can. It's got, it looks like a hinge with a damper almost or something. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's very cool. So very we're cool. not going to go, but 25 or 30. So we'll leave the windshield up. Sure. But what about those levers there? Uh, next to you. These things, I don't know what they do. They make it grind when you... <laughs> <laughs> One is the emergency brake, i.e. the only brake, really. Yeah, okay. You have a foot brake too, but you have more leverage on the handbrake. Okay. And then this is a progressive transmission. It's a three-speed transmission. And what does progressive mean? It's not gated, so it's all in line. Okay. So it's like a motorcycle. Um, that we, you keep kicking the gears, you go up, 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 or down, down, down. I see, yeah. So it, it's, it's one, one movement from here all the way down right. through your three speed and your reverse. Okay. It does have reverse. And huh. once, once you kind of feel the, the gears, they go in nice and they're quiet enough and, and you can go down the road at 50 mile an hour with it if you want. Okay. Or 10 mile an hour with it if you want. Yeah. But they're very crude cut gears. You know, they're just giant cogs, not even up to the up to the quality of a spur gear. Oh, really? I mean, the gears are kind of rounded and kind of like, yeah, not very, but you put enough thick oil in it and they're quiet enough and <laughs> it works fine there and they're go. real. Okay. Well, I guess let's uh, hear this thing start up. Okay. Wow, that is a quiet machine. I have nice oil pressure. Okay, so now I'm gonna put it in the first gear. Well, I think it's first gear. I... And now it's a it's a big cone clutch and a big flywheel, so it'll be jerky. Okay. And it hasn't engaged for six months. Yep. I'm gonna test the brakes. Sounds like yep, they were good. Okay. I appreciate you doing that. Yeah. We're going to turn to the right, okay. probably. <laughs> now I'm going to shift it again. I'm in a different gear. Yeah. gear. I could be in the in my lane if I want. What is uh, likely approximate top speed in a high gear? What is this thing like I think I think 30 years ago I got to 68 mile an hour oh, wow. one time and I think um, I think my speed to be happier is gonna be probably more like 50 55. Yeah. This engine only has about <coughs> 200 miles on it since I rebuilt it. Okay. So this next tour is 400 miles. So I'm going to be happy going 40 or 45 just to break it in nice. Sure. That makes so sense. It's a nice running car. Yeah. It really is. So this is really about as early a production car in America that would really kind of run today. I mean, this is for 1905 in an American car. There's not, there's not very many of these in the whole world that run. Right, very short list, if anything. 
makes sense. We'll probably be the only one in America today in a car this old. <laughs> what a privilege. I appreciate you bringing me along. This is fantastic. Now we'll lug it and see what it does. Yeah, this is still top gear? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's perking along. Oops, I shouldn't do that. Okay, I won't do that anymore. Okay. Didn't break anything, though. No, it looks good. I think we're okay. They convert something different than you think. Right. <laughs> so I know so there's a gas gauge down there, but I guess uh, it's not as accurate perhaps as the stick. That's a gas that's a gas pressure gauge. Well oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Got it. You told me that already. Can you imagine being back 120 years ago where nobody has a car and you're just doing this? Yeah, I don't even know what you're doing or how you're doing right. it. But it, 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 it's just pleasant, it's nice. It's very pleasant. But what are the two levers behind the steering wheel? What are they for on the car? Timing and fast idle. Okay. So we can turn the idle up, we can turn the idle down, we can turn the timing up and down. Okay. Because <laughs> we're not really tr pushing it much. Yeah. timing. Oh, no, no, no. A lot more. We're not trying for high speed. No. But you can have more of it if you want. Right. That's... We're just doing a 25 mile an hour version of Frank Yeoman, the original owner, fought in the Civil War. Did he really? Yeah. Oh, wow. That, that, Give me an idea how where this fits in the history. Yeah, that's crazy. Fought in the Civil War and bought this car. Yep. That is uh, just amazing. Totally fascinating piece of trivia right there. Around the block, residential neighborhoods, slow speeds, already super enjoyable. Yeah. Like a very enjoyable experience. Now, what is it like at 60 mile an hour? Well, it wants to wander around. Uh -huh. you, you always have the limitation of, you know, how good are the axles today right. from 120 years ago? How good is the drive shaft? How good is all have, of it or have any, any of it? stress cracks developed? Right. They have anything. So yeah. it's almost nice to keep it at, you know, reasonably low speeds. Yep. And it's so pleasurable because it, it does its job perfectly. Yeah, it really does. So there's a wooden box under the seat here. Is that a toolbox or just a glove box or kind that's, of thing? Or? That's for the registration and stuff. Okay. Just pretty ornate. Yeah, I was noticing it just the woodwork matches yep. the, the dashboard here. So that's, that's just beautiful. Everything is beautiful. The brass and the wood and the metal work, you know, it's all... It all comes together so well. And, then, and leather, is these leather straps here? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. So what is, uh, when you go on your uh, 
your trip, your 400 mile tour. Yes. What's the longest day that you're likely to go? 120 miles. Okay. The final day, that is the actual New London to New Brighton. I got you. And that 120 miles, that probably starts at uh, six or seven in the morning and mm -hmm. finishes at probably three or four in the afternoon. Okay. So you're not expected to still drive more than well, there's going to be vehicles that are going to have a top speed of 25 mile an hour. Sure. So the the fact that this can go faster is great. Yeah. And we will sometimes. Mm -hmm. And and where it where we will drive faster is is open roads that are pretty clear that aren't scary to us. Yeah. So if we have a handling issue or a braking issue or a traffic issue. Uh, we wouldn't have those issues in that area, so we'll step it up some. Sure. But anytime there's a narrow road or, or cul-de-sacs or curve arrows or, you know, circles in the center of the road, we're going to drive much more conservative. Yeah. Well, that's probably wisdom speaking right there. <laughs> that's good. Well, thank you so much for sharing the experience of this car, Alan. Uh, what an amazing car. And what a piece of history between the car itself, but also the documentation that you have for the history of it just all combines to be just such a fascinating combination. So thank you for that. Thank you.